Uh, it's really nice to be here and I was really excited. So many people uh, had signed up and I'm excited for every single one of you who uh, made time to come today. I imagine that there's thousands of online meetups you could have chosen and we're really happy that you're here at this one. So I am going to hit this continue button just in case that's being recorded. Okay, so as Jose said, I'm Julia Wester. I don't spend a lot of time on intros because the more important stuff is the stuff we're gonna talk about about metrics. But just some basic stuff is I've been tweeting and blogging at Everyday Kanban, gosh, since like 2012 or earlier, maybe, maybe 2011 or 10. Um, I have not been doing it nearly as much as I wanted to lately, so uh, I need to get better at that, but uh, you can connect with me personally there. Professionally, um, I am a co-founder of 55 Degrees Abe, or AB, and what that is is a product and consulting company here, located here in southern Sweden. I moved from Seattle, Washington in the U.S. to Svedala, Sweden in uh, July of last year, so it's our year anniversary. Um, and I'm also a scrum.org PST. Uh, ProKanban.org founding member. That's a new thing you may or may not have heard about, but you can always find out more from Jose or uh, me later. And an Agenda Shift partner. So these are different uh, things that I ascribe to, believe in the teachings of, and take time to teach those to others. Um, and everybody can see my screen, right? I didn't ask. Okay. So this is not, even though this talk is about metrics and I have a metrics product, there's only two times it's gonna be mentioned right now to say, hey, I'm a product owner too. This is a new skill that I'm learning. Um, we reach, we at 55 Degrees recently acquired Actionable Agile. And so in addition to those other things, I work as a product manager and talk to customers a lot of times about the metrics that they're using in our tool, questions they have, et cetera. So um, again, that's, the only time until the very end that you're going to hear about that, and that's to give you some promo codes if you want them. Okay, but what you're really here to talk about today are metrics mistakes. So I wanted to go over six common metrics mistakes, and of course I don't just want to talk about all the bad sides. I want to talk about things that you might be able to do to avoid them when they happen. Um, maybe how you might recognize them or uh, and things that you can do to avoid them. Now I do want to give a caveat that I'm not saying that these six are the most important six you'll ever come across or the most impactful six. These are just six that I really feel strongly about, have experienced quite a lot, have spoken about with others a lot, and I wanted to share them with you. Now after the talk at the very end, um, we're gonna have some interactivity and mural and you're gonna have the opportunity to uh, tell me a little bit about what you think about these and to mention things that I didn't mention. Uh, whether there are other mistakes that you've experienced, tips and tricks that you would have talked about had you been doing this talk. So we'll have some interactivity at the end. Okay, I'm gonna dive into my very first and, and maybe most fundamental and impactful mistake that you can make in metrics. And it's simply not having a why. I don't know why, but whenever I think about this, I always think of Simon Sinek, start with why. But a lot of times we don't even think about why we're using metrics. We have them, we use them, we get a tool, there's a default set of metrics, or you go to a conference and someone says, use these metrics. And so you use those metrics, but you never really sit down a lot of the times and think about specifically what you're doing with this metric, why you're measuring it, what would happen if you stopped, and lots of other bad things uh, that could happen from using this metric without a reason why. Um, and that can happen because sometimes you don't really know where to start. And so it's easier just to start and think about that you'll get to that later, if ever, but later usually doesn't come. We don't have a lot of free time that we just go back and do those things, you know, those post-project lists, uh, those usually get sort of left on the wayside. Um, the first thing that I want to say about this is that there is absolutely no one right set of metrics. If Jose or um, Ahmad or myself or other people come and tell you this is the set of metrics you should use, you should run screaming. Because unless we know your context, 
we have no idea what metrics that you should use. So you cannot just copy what works for someone else unless your context is exactly like theirs in all ways. So you can learn from them and maybe understand why they use a specific set of metrics. And you might take parts of those and that might work for you, but you actually have to go through a thinking process to make sure that you don't actually do more harm than good by copying someone else's metrics. And when I think about this, I like to think about a doctor's appointment because everyone's been to the doctor. I, I would think everyone's been or almost everyone's been because I guess you can never say always or never. Um, but think about going to the doctor and imagine if you went in and they just started running all these random crazy tests on you and you're like, dude, I'm just here because I have a cough. You don't need to like get a CAT scan of my appendix or something like that, right? Um, and then they do all that and then they talk to you about why you're there. That's sort of what we do with our metrics. We just take all these things uh, because we have the data, so we might as well get it. Um, but we don't, we don't really think about why we're using that. So what you expect to happen is at a doctor's office is, yes, when you come in, there's a nurse. They take some baseline metrics every single time you come in. They get your temperature, they take your blood pressure. They do these other things that are indicative of general health. We know that enough about them that we can say these are applicable to almost all people, if not all people, right? And then they come in and they discuss with you, why are you here today? What is your problem? And then, and only then, do they figure out what other tests to run? Or, you know, and, and in this case, the tests are the metrics. They're doing blood tests, they're getting data, they're helping figure out things about your condition that they can analyze and figure out a course of action for you to be healthy. And that's exactly what we're doing with metrics. We are looking at what our problems are. We're trying to figure out what insight and data we need to understand what we can do to get us to a place of general health and excellent health. So I wanna to talk to you about a method called ODEM to help us get to that point where we really understand um, why exactly we're using every metric and what it helps us do. Okay, so this is something that I first heard about from Larry Maccheroni, okay? And uh, on the slide, whenever I'm pulling from someone else, there's a link to their materials so that you'll know that when it's from me or when it's from someone else. Okay, so a lot of times we start with the measurement and then we figure out what insides we can get from that and then we decide things that we can decide about that and then we see what happens. But what we really want to do is turn that on its head. We want to think the outcomes first, a very outcome focused approach. What do we need to happen? What outcomes do we want to see? Then we have to think about what decisions do we have to make on a regular basis to take us to that outcome? Then we go to I, what insights do we need to help us make that decision? And then once we know what insights we need, then we can determine the metric that we might want to use to help us achieve that outcome. Okay. And before I get into an example on that, um, this is not a one to one. So for any outcome, there could be multiple decisions that you have to make. For any decision, there could be multiple insights that you could or might want to look at that. And so you can end up with multiple metrics for one outcome, but re and that it would be good to explore those different paths. Um, but you always want to make sure to walk through this ODEM process to make sure that you're not measuring things thinking it's helping you achieve an outcome, but you actually don't know what you do as a result of having that data. Okay, so let's take an example of the outcome. Okay, so I'm thinking here, we've got a team and we have a lot of rework happening. Things are just not going right. So we want to reduce the time and cost for rework. Okay, so I'm thinking about small day-to-day -day decisions, not you know, ginormous decisions that you only make every month or three. Uh, we want to think about decisions that we make often and, uh, and that will sort of trickle on and help us. So what are some small day-to-day -day decisions that I can make? Well, one of them, because you could have many, one of them is, well, should we focus on increasing time that we spend on testing activities, whether that is writing more unit tests or doing, you know, uh, QA types of testing, it doesn't matter, but should we increase the testing time or effort? Okay, because that would take money and um, direction to the group to change how we're working. 
So to answer that question and make that decision, one of the things that we need to do is get some insights. Okay? And one of the biggest insights we need to determine is are we finding defects early enough? Or at least this was my thought process um, as I was going through this one time, okay? And so I think about that insight and I'm, it's, you know, sometimes it takes you all to think, what will tell me, what metric can I use, what can I measure to help me know if we're finding defects early enough? And then if we're finding them early enough, then maybe we don't need to increase testing time and effort. Maybe we need to do something else, right? Make a different kind of decision. So the first thing I thought about when I was going through this process is, oh, well, I can measure escape defects because everybody knows about escape defects, right? That, that's defects that make it all the way to production. But I have to question myself, does that really give me the expected insight? Because oftentimes we jump to a conclusion. I just, no, I just had that, that movie Office Space and the Jump to Conclusions game in my head. But <laughs> we jump to a conclusion uh, that oh, we know this metric, it's related to defects, so that's gonna give me the insight that I need, but let's sort of walk through that. So escape defects, I started with this metric, I can see how many made it to production and less is good, but I couldn't see how many we prevented. And out of those that we prevented, where did we find them in the process? Because my question was, did we find them early enough? And to me, production isn't early enough. And this only tells me the ones that I found in production. So it's some good information, um, but it's not as specific as I wanted. So I kept going. And I said, well, then maybe I can sort of identify my different environments that my code moves through. And I want to look at defects per environment. So I pick a count, right? And so this is showing me the count of defects that we found per month in each environment. And I want more to be in the dark gray and then a little less in the lighter gray. And actually, sorry, I want to be more in the blue. And then as I get to the gray, I want it to be little or non-existent, right? Because I want to find things early. So I'm getting closer, but this still wasn't really easy. This chart wasn't really easy enough for me to tell if I was finding things early enough. So I kept that questioning process going, and then I could start to see, using the same kind of information but with percentiles, I could really start to see the relationship of how early we're finding things and how we're progressing over time if we're finding more in earlier in the process and fewer later in our process closer to production. Um, and I felt like going through that thinking process was a difficult exercise uh, to build the muscles of really thinking through, does this metric give me the insight like I want in the best way that I could use it? Um, because as you'll see here, you can use one metric and show it on different kinds of charts in different ways. And each one is gonna give you a slightly different angle at looking at that. And sometimes you need one angle more than you need the other. And in a different situation, it could be the other way around. So you're thinking about, does this metric provide what I need to, to get the insights? And does the way I'm presenting it, which the chart that I'm using it in, is it giving me the insight in the best way possible? So went through this process, because you don't always get it right the first time, and ended up with this, which you know worked well enough for a while. Okay, so starting the first metric mistake of not having the why, using this process of ODEM, Outcome Decision Insight Measure, by Larry Maturoni is really one of my favorite ways to ensure that we know why we're measuring every single thing we measure. And as we talk through the rest of the, the metrics mistakes, it's gonna be really clear why it's really important to know why you're using a metric, okay? So, Odom. Okay, number two, refusing to acknowledge the game. And what I mean by that is not considering how metrics can be gamed. And I don't mean gamifying it so that we're, you know, trying to make them move the right way for the right reasons, although that's certainly an awesome thing to do. The mistake is refusing to acknowledge how people can try to make a metric look awesome and ruin the whole world on the way there. Okay, so this is all based on an underlying truth that what you measure shows what you value. 
And that's the first step. Understanding this is the first step of, you know, really understanding why having a why for each metric is extremely important. Okay. What we measure shows what we value. So if I'm measuring all these things and employees in my company are watching me measure these things, they're going to inherently know that I value that even without me having a conversation. And even more so if anything about their compensation or kudos or anything are related to the metrics that I'm measuring. So anytime someone sees me measure something, there's this assumption that I value that. So we have to be really careful about our actions and what they portray to the other people. <clears throat> and when people think we value something, they're naturally going to try to optimize for that if they have the opportunity. So if I'm measuring throughput, um, which is the number of items finished in a given period of time, it's a rate, um, then, and people know I'm measuring that, then they're going to try to get more things done in shorter periods of time, uh, subconsciously or consciously. And they're going to make choices when they try to improve that metric some of them subconsciously and some of them consciously, and not all of those are going to have the outcomes that you desire. They might make throughput go up, but they could really break something else. Okay, uh, so sometimes this can be harmless, but sometimes it can be extremely harmful as well. I love this Dilbert slide so much that I actually got the license to use it <laughs> in a presentation because it is just exactly what we're talking about. So you have your tech support dude or you know gal here, and as soon as they answer the phone, they're like, can I close your ticket now? It's like the doctor's office going crazy. They haven't even talked to you yet about your problem, but they wanna be done with you. Why? Well, because they're evaluated on how many trouble tickets they close. They're not necessarily evaluated on how helpful they were or the value they added by closing them. They are evaluated on that throughput of trouble tickets, how many I close. Okay, and that can be super frustrating, but if you understand the incentives that they have, you can understand why they're doing it. And instead of yelling at people, which yes, this is dumb to do, so they should know better, right? Where you have to understand too that we put them in that, that position by using this metric without necessarily thinking it through. We basically told them how to behave. So I love this quote by Eli Goldratt. Most people just say the first part, tell me how you'll measure me and I'll tell you how I'll behave. But I love the second part. I think it's more important. If you measure me in an illogical way, do not complain about my illogical behavior because by measuring me that way, you are telling me to behave in a certain way. Okay. Now, I wanna pull out one example that I see very commonly is we work in teams and we work in organizations and we're trying to do things for the benefit of the whole, right? But all the time we see uh, measurements of individuals, measurements of teams or silos or departments, and we don't always connect that back to the outputs for the entire organization. Or if we're measuring teams, the outputs for the department. Um, you know, and a lot of times we see people measuring individuals and those individuals want to be recognized. They want to feel like they're valued. And again, what you measure says what you value. So they're going to often do whatever they need to do to be in that top spot, right? And the things that happen when they do that aren't always going to cause the outcomes that you want. One example that I think it's been around for a long time, but Carmelo Anthony was an NBA player, maybe still is, actually used to be a manager for the NBA.com website a um, long time ago, but uh, never actually been to an NBA game. But he was one of the highest um, rated individual players. His stats were awesome, but he, his team lost more when he played. So you had a superstar got excellent stats personally, but when he played, his team lost. That's what we do all the time at work because we're not focusing on, you know, how people impact the team. And the reason why, in case you're wondering, is because he had a worse 
uh, shot percentage than everyone else. So he had to steal more shots away from other people that were better at getting it in the net to get those higher stats that he had. So he took more shots over time, so had higher shots, but had other people taken those, they potentially actually could have scored higher on the team. He stole that opportunity away from other team members to get his personal stats really high. So when we're measuring our individuals, what we're saying, especially if you're measuring them on cycle times or throughputs or all these things that I will tell you are great metrics to use, the reason why I don't look at them on an individual basis is because when I do that, it makes people make choices I don't want them to make. They're having to choose between making themselves look good and doing what's best for the team. And sometimes what's doing the best for the team is taking a hit on your personal stats and helping other people or making other choices that don't necessarily make you shine as an individual performer if we're not measuring things like how you help other people, which I don't know how many of you do, but I've not seen people do that very much. Um, so what I like to think about this is don't put people in a position where they have to make a choice that is best for themselves, but hurts the whole. So everything you measure, you need to ask, is this making people make a choice? Okay, so the way that I think is a good way to handle, uh, get a handle on how people could game different metrics is to do a little group activity with your team. And the way I've played this before is it's got three rounds. I'm gonna go over each one. And for each question or activity, I did a one, two, four, all approach, which is like a minute to think on yourself, by yourself and get your own ideas out. Then you talk in pairs, then you talk in fours, and then you come together and consolidate as a group. So these are the questions that, um, that I do for each metric, or I suggest people do for each metric. You take it and you say, how can I game it? How can we as a group of people game it? Because this is a team activity. Managers doing this on their own will not think of all the awesome ways that people could destroy everything by optimizing this metric. So in, you know, embrace the inherent desire of people to sometimes be super snarky and give them an outlet to do this in this kind of thing. So take a given metric for each one, ask this question, how can we make it look awesome but actually hurt things instead? Do a round on that. Then ask people to think about if we did those things, what are the impacts to our organization? Yes, this might look good, but what's the actual cost or hurt to our organization if we did this, right? Because generally we know why we want to measure something and this is the part that we don't think about the dark side. And so then now we have the assumed benefit. I didn't actually ex, you know, explicitly say think about the benefit of measuring it, but what we're doing here is if you come to this knowing why you wanna measure it, and then you get the impact of how people could like ruin the world, then you can do sort of like a cost benefit ratio kind of thought process and decide, do we even need to measure this at all? Is it way too risky? Or, it's risky, but we need to measure it. So what are we gonna to do to make this safer? What other things are we gonna put in place to minimize people's need to game this in a negative way? Sometimes that can be talking, sometimes it can be other things that we're gonna talk about, okay? So that's, that's a game to play with your team. Very similarly, or uh, very closely related is shaming people with metrics. And you know, anytime you're doing individuals, um, it's a competition and you might not be calling out the people who did poorly, but that's the flip side of not being recognized, right? If, uh, if you're focusing on building superstars, they're getting all the recognition. So it's like a quiet shame for the other people who aren't getting recognition. But um, there's a more, a worse way that I'm going to talk about in a second. So I like bringing in quotes when I think they're particularly relevant and Goldratt and Deming are my go-tos for metrics. And one of the things that Deming says is in his book, New Economics, is he says that fear invites wrong figures, okay? Because if they're afraid, you know, they, yes, they might game it, but they also might, you know, fudge things. Bearers of bad news fare badly, so we only want to present good news to people, right? That's like, you know, project managers who are, I've had project managers who are told that they cannot say the project is red, right? So if that thing is green until it just really hits the fan and no one can ignore it anymore. And then they get yelled at, but they were told they could never say that it was red. 
that is, you know, that kind of stuff is crazy. We want to see the truth. So we can't make people afraid to tell us the truth. Okay. Now, here's an example. Um, I got this from Troy McGinnis. My very first conference talk, I co-spoke with Troy McGinnis, who's an excellent uh, metrics, uh, agile statistician person. I recommend a lot of his stuff. Um, this is a picture that he took at one of his um, consulting engagements in Seattle, where I used to live. And this was on a monitor in the break room near the executive's office. Okay, so this is 10 bugs or more chart. So this is like a naughty list. Any team member who has 10 or more bugs assigned to them is on this list, right? And they have their names and they have this little bar chart, right? So you look and you're like, oh, this dude, what's going on here? And so some people are like, oh, what a slacker, right? So I know if I'm team member one, that some people might be thinking about that. So I'm, we're gonna talk about that in a second. What might I do? to not get my name on this board. Some people are thinking, dude's a slacker, horrible person. Someone might be a little more understanding and say, wow, I bet they're really working on other priorities right now. Probably not your first thought when you look at this chart. Or someone might say, hey, makes sense. That person's code just went through this deep exploratory testing session, so lots of bugs got put in. But I can guarantee you most people are thinking on the what a slacker kind of thing. And even if they're not, that's what team number one is thinking people are thinking, especially the executives who walk by this every day, multiple times a day. And so putting people on naughty lists like this is going to cause at, you know, things to happen. Some of those things might be good and some of those things might be bad. So what I wanna do is ask for some people to maybe, we'll just take a couple, to type in the chat. If you were team member one on this chart, what might you do to get your name off this list that might not be great for the company? Let's just give a minute for people to type into chat. <laughs> Write less code, take on easy work, stop reporting bugs, market is not producible, <laughs> yell at management. I like this. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can do by taking just one minute to think about it. You know, so if you are taking that uh, game from, you know, the, the last mistake and running something like this through it for even just a couple of minutes, you're going to see things that you need to prepare for if you're going to use a chart like this. So you're going to need to think about how to minimize the danger. Uh, and the biggest thing you can focus on on thinking about how to remove the danger is figuring out ways to remove the choice between company and self. So make your metrics focus on outcomes. Like if you're measuring um, the number of bugs overall, um, that might be more useful than by individual people or the impact of bugs. Also not all bugs are created equal. Some are impactful, some are not. That chart didn't care about any of that. Um, measure individuals only when it makes sense. Understand the audience for your team. And by, make sure you tell your team if if you choose to use a metric that turns out to make them make uncomfortable choices, make sure they let you know, because this is a team effort. You're all in it together. No one's trying to put people in this kind of bad spot. And that last bullet takes us right into mistake number four, confusing activity with success, okay? And one of the things that a lot of people focus on are what I like to call vanity metrics or Productivity metrics is a maybe a nicer way to, to claim it. And these are metrics that are easy to get. How many you know, followers do you have on Twitter as a consultant or speaker? You know, that feels good. I feel like movement is happening. Uh, things are increasing, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything to me, right? And we fool ourselves that sometimes these can proxy for important information, okay? So the first thing is to think about what the metrics really help you. Is it telling me I get a lot done or is it telling me the things that I get done add value? So examples of things that uh, reflect I get a lot done are a lot of number of. When you see number of, that's a trigger to make sure it's really telling you what you think it's telling you. Number of lines of code written. Did you know that some government contracts in the US still pay you based on lines of code. 
I learned that a couple years ago at a DevOps Enterprise Summit. That's crazy. Okay, a number of issues closed. We just talked about that. Number of deploys per day. We're going to talk about that. Number of points finished. Now, these are all things that can be very helpful, but they are proxies for information like, you know, revenue generated, revenue protected, cost avoided, cost saved. These are things that we really want to get an eye on, and we're thinking that these other things are going to tell us, but we don't always verify that connection between the vanity or productivity metrics and the outcome-based metrics, okay? One of the things that you can do, um, besides ODEM, ODEM is a great way to make sure that that metric can map back to an outcome. And um, one thing I forgot to say is, I presented it like you don't have any metrics going on right now, right? So you start with um, outcomes and then you work your way up. Well. You can still do that, forget what you have and work the way up, but you can also try to take the backwards approach, see if you can map it back to an outcome, and then if you can't, discard it. Um, a quicker sort of sniff test, per se, that doesn't quite take as much work is to just ask, so what? And by that means, by that it means, does it matter to my customer, right? Does the customer care whether or not I've got this many likes, right? Um, or does it help me make a decision or take an action? So that sort of ties you back to the ODEM, but the ODEM is like a heavier hitter, really makes you make that connection. This is more of a lint test or a sniff test. Okay. okay. Number five, blindly pursuing targets. And you'll notice that a lot of these are sort of related. There's elements of one and the others. And a lot of these times it relates to taking a numerical target like, you know, well, we're going to talk about one in a second. And having people sort of put blinders on and going for it whole hog, okay? So Deming says, if you give a manager a numerical target, he'll make it even if he has to destroy the organization in the process. Okay. And what that means is if I take information that I learn, like information from the state of DevOps, and I learn that people in you know, elite performing teams deploy 106 times faster than non-performers. And that means from uh, lead time from commit to deploy. So the time it takes to deploy a line of code. That by the way is a perfection challenge, right? How fast can I get it down to to deploy a line of code, okay? Now there's nothing wrong with making targets in general. You could say, let's get it down so we can deploy code in 10 minutes max from commit to deploy. We're gonna get our pipeline all set. We're gonna do all of this. That is a great thing to strive for, okay? So let's think about it. Here we're at, we start at snail, like we're going super slow and we need to get all the way to 10 minutes max at the target. So let's say maybe our snail pace right now is it takes two days for us to deploy, right? That's crazy, long, happens. Um, happened for me at a five when we didn't even have automated building in, right? It took a long time to do stuff. So when you're at two days, focusing on 10 minutes is a real big driver. But what happens when you get to like, you're at 15 minutes, right? And then you have some decisions to make. Thanks for letting me know that you can hear me when I hit my hands. So if you get to 15 minutes and you, you might want to question at this point, you know, have we met the goal of getting to our target? So when we made the goal of 10 minutes, what I mean is that there's nothing magical about 10, 10 minutes. We could have set it at 11 minutes or nine minutes or 13 minutes. What we wanted to be was not at two days. And we wanted to reach this elite performer status of being able to deploy really fast. So the point I'm trying to make is as you get closer to that target, making the incremental further improvements is not necessarily as beneficial as you might think. And where this comes in, I've seen it in some of my clients as a problem, is that a lot of times we make our goals specific targets, like we're going to get our deployment down to two hours or something like that, right? And so now we're tied to this goal. We've committed to this goal. And sometimes we can't change that. But then we have other things that take priority. And we have to make decisions. We, we've made it to two and a half hours. But if we don't make this extra 30 minutes and hit our goal, we don't get our bonus. So 
doing that extra 30 minutes, that work that it takes, um, that maybe may not make a huge impact in our life, could cost us the opportunity to reach something greater and to do something that would more dramatically improve. So as you're working toward a target, you need to watch for decision points where you can maybe call it good enough. So that's the last thing here to make target safer is at, from the bottom up is know when to call it good enough. Um, even better, the first bullet set targets in terms of outcomes rather than tactics. So what was the reason I wanted to get to 10 minutes? Instead of setting my target to 10 minutes, set the target to the outcome instead. And then you can treat tactics as experiments. And when you're doing experiments, then it's okay to change directions. Well, if I get to 10 minutes, does this get me to my outcome? Um, you know, and, and you have a bit more leeway. And look at the broader cost of the target. If you kept going for that last few bit, what else could you put at risk? Okay, the last thing that I wanna talk about is the problem of fixing it here, breaking it there. I really love this picture because it's, it's, it's such, so indicative of tunnel vision. I really need to optimize this metric. So I'm gonna do whatever I can, even if I make the house fall down. That's what we're talking about here, okay? We're gonna skip this slide. Okay, <clears throat> now one of the best ways to go about doing this is to measure things that are in tension with each other, things that compete, okay? Because the problem here isn't that we're focused on that metric, the problem is we're focused on that metric to the exclusion of everything else. We've lost our ability to think of the system as a whole because we're not seeing the um, unexpected consequences of our actions. We're only focused on what we're doing and we're focusing on the expected consequences. So in order to keep fix it here, broke it there out of our, out of our sort of happenings, we need to give ourselves ways that help us see what's happening outside of our expected consequences. That's the definition of systems thinking. But from a metric standpoint, the things that we can do are look at, if I need to measure quality, we've got to improve quality. How can I make sure that we don't focus on quality so much to the cost of responsiveness? Because if we stop deploying, then we'll lose customers too, just as much as our bad quality. And so we can measure these things as long as they're in tension with something else, um, then we can control how much we allow ourselves to accidentally break something. Because ideally, if we're measuring these things, especially side by side, then I'll see by overdriving for quality if I'm having a negative impact on responsiveness or predictability. Um, and I'll see that correlation and I can make a, you know, I can notice that faster and do something about it. Now these quadrants, um, there's four, so obviously quadrants, but people have since taken them to six. I think Troy McGinnis has an example of a team dashboard that has six aspects. Um, but Larry Maccheroni came up with the Software Development Performance Index by analyzing a lot of data from Rally where he used to work. And he came up with these quadrants as areas of general health. So essentially, if you're measuring something that tells you how well you do it, how fast you do it, what your pace is, and how repeatable you can be about that pace, if you're measuring something in all those areas, you're getting a general balanced view of your health. These can be your baseline test at the doctor's office, right? This is your baseline. But what you put in these needs to match your context. So you need to go back to something like Odom to make sure you figure out the right things to measure for your group, okay? Now, Troy McGinnis has a balanced um, a behavioral polarity worksheet, and I've got the link here on this slide. This is a piece of it, and the next slide will be a piece of it. But one of the things that you can do is walk through this template. So I want to measure time and process, like the time it takes, cycle time, lead time, flow time, whatever you want to call it. Um, trended every one sprint as a measure of responsiveness. Okay. That's one of our quadrants. But we're also going to measure escape defects to detect if we overdrive improving responsiveness and suffer elsewhere like quality. Okay, so it's just a little helpful template to make sure you're making it through. And another piece of this that I think is really good for you to think about as you're doing this and as you're deciding which metrics to use to balance is to take your metric and to sit down and think about 
what would happen, positive or negative, if I totally ignored this metric? And what would happen if I totally focused on it? Positive and negatives, okay? And you usually don't wanna be at either extreme. You're gonna to wanna to be somewhere in the middle. And so you might wanna think about early warning signs that you're tending to go too far away from this metric or early warning signs that you're tending to go too much into this metric, okay? Um, I have a spectrum thinking worksheet that's similar to this. Uh, actually, I got started thinking about it from Troy, but then uh, added some plan, do, study, act kind of components. This is like a overview of one sheeter, but I've got more like a team worksheet um, on GitHub that really helps you walk through each specific step of this and trying to get you to come up with the things that Troy had on the worksheet, but then figuring out where you need to be on that spectrum and then helping you understand experiments to get there. So it's a little bit like that on steroids. Okay. So what, what hypothesis can you make to get closer to your goals that you defined in Odom? So to summarize, basically of all the mistakes and tactics that I shared, uh, I think you can sum it up generally into understanding what you want to measure and why. Do the work to understand how your metrics can impact things you aren't normally focused on. Okay? Because uh, the gaming, the fix it, broke it there, those are all things that are just outside of our view, right? So we need to understand how, what things might happen outside of our view because of what we choose to measure. And then once we know that, only then can we take steps to keep an eye on those things and minimize undesired impacts, okay? So that that's sort of the gist of, of my talk and the things that I want to start discussing with you over on Mural and bring this more into an interactive space. Um, but there's just a couple of sort of things I want you to know about so that you can, uh, as we get into interactivity, people might start dropping off and stuff. So I want to share this now and then sort of move over to Mural and not come back to Keynote. So on my website, 55degrees.se slash events, um, you'll find things like uh, you see here. Um, some free, some not. So see if there's anything you're interested in. Um, I'm also keen for other people to do webinars that we promote. So if you have stories about metrics, let us know. Um, you can engage with us to learn more about things that are coming up so you don't have to keep checking the site by subscribing here and here's how you can find my company. Um, one of the things I wanted to do as a thank you for coming here is that if you're looking for a uh, flow metrics solution, um, I wanted to give you two months free on new subscriptions, new monthly subscriptions, or a 20% off a new yearly subscription. They all have free trials, so you could just do the trial. But if you felt like you wanted to subscribe after that, uh, you can go to analytics.actionableagile.com and you can use these promo codes. This, um, I'll make sure that you get the slides after this, but if you super wanna make sure you get it, you can take a screen grab now. <laughs>